Vision becomes a milestone when it helps make our lives richer with love and laughter. When it helps make a cleaner, smarter and a more beautiful planet. So that you can set off on joyous new journeys and adventures. Building stronger bonds and bridging impossible distances which take you from the ever new to the forever beautiful. Opening up vistas and windows to a vibrant new world. A vision becomes a milestone when it touches millions of lives. Aditya Birla Group. Big in your life.
evolve is the core of positive change and adaptation. Evolve is the soul of the universe and is deeply connected to us and the actions around us. There will be one thing that will last forever. Evolution. Be a part of the business evolution of India. WTC. World Trade Center, Delhi at Noruji Nagar. And be a part of the global culture. We keep our accomplishments fresh and we keep innovating this space. We are driven by the Government of India's vision to drive growth for India. We had a dream to bring the best of the world to India. And we had the vision to create a majestic, holistic and exclusive reality. Be a part of one of India's largest commercial space revolutions. WTC, World Trade Center, Delhi, at Noruji Nagar. The World Trade Center offers exceptional connectivity to all parts of the city. It is closely connected to places like Lajans, Delhi, and its proximity to the airport makes it even more appealing. A luxurious, upscale and 12 towers offering the most technologically advanced office space and modern features in the city. Meticulously planned and crafted 12 towers. A landmark project with a massive land span of over 34 lakh square feet area. Infused with all the modern amenities with intelligent designs, green spaces and high-end facilities. Built with a vision, planned for a greener today and tomorrow. Dedicated spaces for cultural activities, FNB courts, boardrooms, health centers, multi-layered securities and modern parking facilities, to name a few. With 24-hour security, state-of-the-art facilities and an impressive list of features for your business, there would be parking space for 8,000 cars. Our commercial office spaces will meet your needs to grow and expand. The spacious floor plans offers a unique, individualized workspace and ample natural light throughout the workday. All our locations in WTC will include state-of-the-art healthcare services, fitness centers, so you can get the most out of your workspace. A reality shaping, rising, shining and standing tall. The dream place for businesses and hospitality. A reflection of supremacy. A hub for businesses to flourish and thrive. Live the dream. Lead the way. Showcase, collaborate and succeed. Be a part of the business evolution. Be a part of global trade revolutions. Many big corporates have already marked their presence at WTC Delhi. Bookings are open. Book your space now. It is a fact of life that every coin has two sides. In our case, people are just familiar with one and that is of being a money lender to the railway sector. So here is an eye-opener. At Indian Railway Finance Corporation, we nurture millions of dreams. The dreams that are powered with new ideas, will and ambition to be on top of the world. We are committed to creating a conducive environment for the railway sector to grow unhindered. Right from planning to backing up its construction to modernization, funding of high-capacity wagons, coaches and high-speed locomotives.
जन औषधि केंद्रों पर मिलने वाली दवाओं की कीमत बाजार में जो दवाएं मिलती हैं उसी क्वालिटी की लेकिन जन औषधि केंद्र में 50 प्रतिशत से 90 प्रतिशत तक उसकी कीमत कम होती है भारतीय जन औषधि परियोजना के अंतर्गत अब तक देश भर में हजारों जन औषधि केंद्र खोले जा चुके हैं जहां पर 1800 से अधिक दवाइयां और दो सर्जिकल उपकरण बहुत ही कम कीमतों पर उपलब्ध हैं। अधिक जानकारी के लिए जन औषधि सुगम मोबाइल ऐप को डाउनलोड करें या टोल फ्री नंबर एक आठ शून्य शून्य एक आठ शून्य आठ शून्य आठ शून्य आरोप कॉल करें जोड़ना है तुझे ऊँचा परों को खोल के रख कसौटी वक्त की है हौसलों को तोल के रख ऊंची है दीवारें लंबी है डगर ना है हम राही ना है हम सफर खगोल हमारे आर एंड आर प्लान में लोग हर साल जो आसपास की ग्रामीण महिलाएं हैं उनको टेलरिंग का क्लास कराते जो स्कूल बैग्स भी हम लोग हर साल बांटते थे साढ़े आठ सौ नौ सौ के लगभग स्कूल बैग्स भी बांटते थे वो बैग्स भी हमने इनसे स्टिच कराए सक्षम बनना चाहते थे हम हमारे पैरों पे खड़ा होना चाहते थे तो हमने एक बार मीटिंग की मीटिंग में बोला कि सर हम इतना कार्य सीखे हैं तो और हमको दुकान खुलवा के तो दुकान खुलवा के भी हम हमको यहाँ दुकान मिलने के बाद हमने सोचा कि हम यहाँ जो भी कार्य करते हैं जो भी चीज़ें बनाते हैं उन चीज़ों पर हमारे प्लान का नाम किया अभी आगाज है तेरा बहुत कुछ सीखना है कमर कसनी अभी बाकी है मुट्ठी भीचना है अभी आगाज है तेरा बहुत कुछ सीखना है हमने फिर इनको अपना एक जो हमारा गर्ल एम्पावरमेंट मिशन का एक प्रोग्राम होता है उसमें कि उसके जो बालिकाएं थीं उनका ड्रेस भी हमने इन्हीं से स्टिच कराया और वो प्रोग्राम में वो ड्रेसेस बहुत सक्सेसफुल थी लोगों ने उनको बहुत अप्रिशिएट किया नेक्स्ट लेवल पे हम ये प्लान कर रहे हैं कि इनको हम जो इंडस्ट्रियल स्टिचिंग मशीनें होती हैं वो हम इनको ला के देंगे इन्हीं जो हमने इन बच्चों को जो ट्रेन किया है दे विल बिकम हमारा ये एक तरीके से एम्बेसडर का काम करे और हमारा ए का जो विजन है कि हम पावर जनरेशन के साथ साथ हम आसपास के लोगों का भी केयर करते हैं इसमें भी हम सफल हो पाएंगे इतिहास लिखने के लिए कलम के नहीं हौसलों की जरूरत होती है थैंक यू एनटीपीसी Welcome to the second day of the HT Leadership Summit where I'm excited to bring to you two very thought provoking sessions around our theme beyond barriers. For our first guest today we delve into the intricate world of technology and global politics with the accomplished author and associate professor of international history at the Fletcher School Chris Miller. His expertise extends across technology, geopolitics, economics and international affairs with a particular focus on Russia. He is the author of Chip War: The Fight for the World's Most Critical Technology and has also contributed three other insightful books on Russia including Putinomics power and money in research in Russia he joins us now for a conversation with R Sukumar HT's editor in chief
Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a very, very special session of the Hindustan Times Leadership Summit. Uh, we have with us uh, Chris Miller, author of The Chip Wars. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read the book. Um, you can see it right here um, on my Kindle, um, I, which is where I uh, uh, first read it. Um, and um, I would recommend everyone get a copy of this book. It is uh, a truly magnificent book uh, written from a historian's perspective because uh, Chris is a historian. Uh, but it, uh, speaks on, it, it speaks on an issue that many of us take for granted. Um, and, and it speaks about uh, something which pretty much makes this conversation possible. I, I mean, I look around me in the studio. Um, Chris is in a hotel room. Uh, overseas. I'm in Delhi. Uh, we are having this conversation online. Um, I'm surrounded by a lot of fancy equipment and also a bit of junk in our studio. And um, there are just so many chips around. And um, they pretty much make the world go around. Um, so I wanted to start uh, with a very, very uh, simple question which is, Chris, uh, what made you write this book? Um, you know, we, we, this is, uh, uh, some aspects of this are, they're not new. It, you know, it, it's been going on for some time. And, and um, so yet no one's really focused on it from the perspective that you've looked at it from. So, so what made you write this book? What sparked that idea? I, like you, over the past uh, number of years, have come to realize the extent to which my life and all of our lives are uh, structured around uh, not just dozens, but hundreds and thousands of tiny silicon chips buried uh, deep in the electronic devices that we rely on. And I came to realize, and this is why I started to write the book, that these chips are not only important because they make our devices possible, but also because all of the key trends that define our world are shaped by these semiconductors, whether it's the uh, shape of the world economy. Uh, for example, China spends as much money each year importing chips as it spends importing oil. You can't understand the, the global trading system without semiconductors. Or if it's the rise of big tech companies and AI, uh, which has been enabled by uh, ever more advanced semiconductors. All of the key trends that are uh, shaping and transforming the world today have semiconductors at their core. And so the book argues that you can't understand the world unless you have semiconductors at the center of your analysis. For us in India, and, and you know, this is uh, over the last year or so, India has really uh, tried very hard to um, enter uh, the chip supply chain in some way. In, in some ways, you can say that at the design end of the spectrum, uh, Indian back offices, uh, the tech back offices have been involved in it to some extent. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, what will it take? Because it's clear from reading your book that um, this isn't simply about uh, plonking down uh, a big bag of money and, and saying, uh, let's build this industry. There, there, is, there is an ecosystem, and, and, and there, there are various aspects to the ecosystem, from, from the uh, pure science at one end to the completely lucrative market at the other, right? I mean, and uh, so what will it take to build a chip, a chip ecosystem today, in this day and age? Well, I think every country today is looking at where they can fit in the chip ecosystem, because right now there's not a single country in the world that is anywhere close to having a self-sufficient uh, supply chain domestically. Everyone is reliant on uh, someone else. And so for countries and for companies, the challenge is to find the niche where they have a comparative advantage uh, and where they can compete at the cutting edge. And so for a country like India, which is trying to build up its semiconductor ecosystem, I think taking the, the major players head on is a, a very big challenge because they're so well established, because they have resources on their side. But the design expertise that you mentioned is something that I think India has a lot of uh, a lot of opportunity to leverage because there's so many different ways you can use design expertise, so many different niches in which uh, it can be expressed. And so that's the challenge for, for really every country is to find the part of the supply chain where their comparative advantage lies. If you were to evaluate the prospects of various countries, um, um, do you think India has a chance of succeeding in its effort to, to become a part of this ecosystem? 
Well, I think India certainly uh, has a very good chance of, of becoming a part of the semiconductor ecosystem. And in some ways, as you alluded to, it already is. There's a, a very large number of semiconductor design experts uh, in India right now. I think the, the question is going to be, can that design ecosystem be further developed? Can more design-focused firms be established in India? And then in other segments of the supply chain, like the manufacturing or the assembly, uh, will India play a bigger role in those segments as well. And the challenge is that there's competition in every step of the supply chain. Uh, India is not alone. Uh, most other major economies around the world are trying to build up their own semiconductor industries. And so when governments and companies think about where to insert themselves, where to focus, they've got to look at the entire competitive landscape and ask where their competitive advantages actually lie. Um, what, what about China? Because uh, China has really made a concerted effort uh, over several years to, to, to really uh, create space for itself in this ecosystem. I mean, they, they've plowed uh, billions of dollars into this effort. Uh, do, do, you, uh, do you think they have succeeded to some extent? Well, measured by the, the metrics that Chinese leaders are looking at, which is the share of chips that China produces domestically, they are making progress. It's still the case that China is hugely reliant on importing high-end chips from Taiwan, from South Korea, from Japan, from the U.S. But compared to 10 years ago, China imports less as a share of its overall chip consumption. But a lot of this has been done in non-economically viable ways. It's been happening because the Chinese government is pouring really vast sums into the industry. And I think that suits the interests of Chinese leaders who are concerned above all about security considerations. It's probably not in the long run interest of uh, Chinese uh, citizens because it's driving up costs, uh, spending huge sums of money uh, without actually producing very many viable businesses. I think China shows the challenges of trying simply by brute financial force to break your way into the industry. You can do it in certain ways, um, but the resource expenditure is vast, tens and tens of billions of dollars every single year. And even then, that doesn't guarantee you actually have viable companies at the end. One of the interesting uh, trends we've seen over the last few years is, is uh, um, a realization that there are limits to globalization. Um, so, so if you uh, went back in time and, and you looked at the late 80s and early 90s, uh, with, it was really a period when uh, companies around the world uh, said, we want to manufacture wherever it's cheapest to manufacture, wherever it's easiest to manufacture. And, and you know, a lot of manufacturing was offshored. And, and I think what we've been seeing, um, and in some ways the pandemic sort of uh, perhaps heightened or quickened this realization, is, is people realized the criticality of certain product categories and, and, and said it, it, it makes sense uh, to have complete control of that supply chain. So, so, so you, you, you're seeing uh, protectionist tendencies when it comes to a spate of things. And, and uh, uh, chips, um, semiconductors is, is one of them. Uh, do you think uh, countries like the US and some countries in Europe will be able to reverse this trend to some extent? Because they've, they've tried to do this with money. They've tried to do this with legislation. Will it work for them? Well, I think w with the U.S., with Europe, also with Japan, you see in the political discourse, political leaders say we want to onshore manufacturing and reverse these offshoring trends. But I think if you look at what government uh, officials are actually doing, it's really less about reversing um, the offshoring of manufacturing and more about addressing much more specific risks. The reality of the chip industry is that there will not be any country that can produce cutting edge chips independently for a very long time, uh, decades. And so the question is how much risk and which types of risks are you willing uh, to bear? <coughs> me. And when it comes to, <coughs> pardon me, when it comes to advanced semiconductors, uh, the challenge right now is that the entire world is hugely reliant on uh, both uh, uh, Taiwan and China for their advanced production. And so that's really the focus uh, when it comes to uh, semiconductor onshoring efforts in both the U.S., in Europe, and in Japan, you spoke about Taiwan, and and Taiwan is 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 interesting in 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 so many ways. Uh, um, it's it's very very interesting from the perspective of the semiconductor industry itself because it it's it's such a uh, critical part of the entire global uh, semiconductor ecosystem. 
and and then there is this uh, geopolitical aspect of taiwan right i mean it it is just uh, such a fraught place geopolitically uh, and and there is a certain amount of uncertainty that is involved and um do, where do you see this going well i think the challenge right now is that it's it's very difficult to confidently predict where the politics will go where chinese policies vis-a-vis -vis taiwan will end up and so companies and countries are trying to reassess their supply chain dependence on both china and taiwan uh, as a result of this uncertainty and companies are finding it's very, very difficult uh, to uh, completely insure themselves against uh, China-Taiwan risk, but they have to because the costs uh, are vast. The, the best estimates of, of the cost in case China were to blockade Taiwan, for example, or to otherwise disrupt semiconductor shipments is that just in the first couple of quarters, there'd be trillions of dollars of damage done to the global economy. And so it's a challenge that uh, neither governments nor companies can afford to ignore, even though it's a very difficult problem to solve because uh, Taiwan does play such a central role in semiconductor supply chains. Uh, let's move on to the industry itself, or rather the product itself. And uh, uh, with we, we are beginning to sense that we may be nearing the limits of Moore's law. Uh, and and uh, you know I, I know peop, peop, and and your book mentions the fact that people have predicted its demise in the past, but but it, this is just uh, the phys the laws of physics, right? Uh, beyond a certain point, it is just going to be economically unviable to keep shrinking things. Um, it, it's just not going to make any sense to do that. Um, what happens to the industry uh, when when we reach that point? Well, I think we're already seeing two different strategies for uh, continuing to improve semiconductors, even as Moore's law gets difficult to pursue. One is designing chips in new ways, uh, because if you don't get uh, more processing power per chip, you can still tweak your designs so that they're perfectly suited for whatever application you want. The best example of this is NVIDIA, which today has the dominant market share in training chips for AI purposes. NVIDIA's chips are not better because the transistors are any smaller than their competitors. They're better because the design uh, is different from their competitors. And so I think we should expect even more focus on semiconductor design as a driver uh, of technological progress. The, the second strategy is to bring different capabilities uh, together on the same chip or on the same uh, in the same package. And so there's an entire discipline of strategies that are often called advanced packaging, which means bringing new types of semiconductors together, moving them closer together so data can intersect, uh, data can uh, go between the semiconductors more rapidly. And companies are spending uh, much of their focus in terms of R&D right now on these types of advanced packaging capabilities, uh, which many people believe will be a second key driver of advances even after Moore's law uh, stops working. Um, which is which is what you uh, in your book refer to as the special purpose chips, right? I mean, you have the general purpose semiconductors and and companies like Nvidia, which are actually um, has done so well. Uh, I mean, you you look at the company's growth and you look at its market value; it, it's clearly doing something right. Um, but but do you see that split widening? Do do you see uh, a sort of commodification of the general purpose semiconductor manufacturing business? Uh, and more companies pumping in lots more money into the special purpose semiconductors? Yeah, I think that that is what we should expect to see. And we already do see it in the, in the early stages. It's not just NVIDIA. It's also all of the big tech firms, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Amazon are designing uh, their own chips. So then increasingly, I think in industrial and automotive applications, we should expect more and more companies to uh, begin designing their own semiconductors as well on the grounds that if they can have chips that are perfectly optimized to their use cases, they'll get major performance uh, increases. So if you look, for example, at Tesla, uh, Tesla designs its own chips for uh, for Tesla cars, and they're the most uh, semiconductor savvy of all the world's auto companies, but I think they won't be alone, and many other companies will begin exploring whether they can also get comparable performance improvements by having specially designed chips. What is the next big thing? Um, because um, you know, we, you, you've always had um, these products or commodities or technologies which which shape geopolitics, and and um, uh, your book makes it very clear that 
for the last 20 years at least uh, the semiconductor has, has played a very very important role in this uh, what next um, what could possibly uh, drive the future well i think the the big challenge that the tech industry faces over the next decade is to apply artificial intelligence to uh, the rest of the economy. We already see companies like OpenAI or Google beginning to try to understand what the, the killer use case of AI will be, but we're still in the early stage uh, of that process. Uh, there's still very few either consumer or industrial applications of AI that are scaled. Uh, and so I think that will be the, the key uh, challenge, the key opportunity for the tech sector uh, going forward. And the, the capabilities that semiconductors have made possible uh, in terms of AI are tremendous, but right now we're still in the very, very early stages of how this will begin to be applied uh, to the rest of the economy. And so that's where I see the most scope uh, for growth over the coming decade. Um, I'm, I'm uh, going to ask you a hypothetical question, uh, which is, um, suppose we are uh, back in the era of Fairchild, right? I'm, at, at a time when, uh, uh, Silicon Valley hasn't even been born. All these guys are still in the East Coast um, and, and they're just going to make the move. And um, decisions that they took, uh, including strategic decisions and uh, over the next 30 years meant that the industry ended up where it was, uh, setting the stage for your book. What are the things they could have done um, with the benefit of hindsight, clearly? Uh, to ensure that the industry remained concentrated in the U.S., at least in terms of manufacturing and the science and the technology. The market, of course, is global. Uh, but suppose you were to apply uh, today's fairly protectionist uh, mindset when it comes to critical industries uh, to something like chips back then, what would you do? Well, if you if you had the perfect benefit of hindsight, you you certainly could have influenced how the industry would have played out. For example, you would have made tax policy and uh, incentive policy quite different. You would have tried to fund the development of uh, semiconductor foundries like Taiwan's TSMC uh, in the United States. Um, that's certainly possible to imagine if you assume perfect hindsight. But the reality is that. Uh, given that the industry needs to race forward at an extraordinarily rapid rate to provide the technological advances that we rely on, policymakers, government officials, even industry leaders struggle to understand exactly the ways the industry is changing. And so uh, rather than uh, 2020 hindsight, we all live in this situation of radical uncertainty about the future. And uh, if, if industry leaders are uncertain, then you can be sure that government uh, officials are even more uncertain because they're less close to the technology. And so that's that's why policymakers have often struggled to understand and try to shape the chip industries because it's racing forward so rapidly they simply can't keep up. One final question on the technology bit. Uh, uh, while we've looked at uh, special purpose and general purpose, uh, one, one of the other areas where uh, a lot of research is happening is, is on the material itself. Right. I mean, uh, the quest for uh, the perfect alternative uh, to silicon, with, which, which can really probably make chips faster and smaller. Um, do you think that's uh, going to be possible? Do you think that will ever be economically viable? Or do you think that's just going to be one of these uh, cold fusion kind of things, which, which uh, sound good in a laboratory environment, but never really get proved? We've seen some alternatives for silicon in certain niche use cases for communications use cases, um, for sensors. Uh, if you look at the semiconductors that are used in electric vehicles to manage the power supply, they're often made of silicon carbide rather than pure silicon. But thus far, all of the non silicon use cases are for niches rather than for computing. Uh, and I think we're going to be in a world dominated by silicon based computing. Uh, for a very long time. The entire industry is structured around it. There are tens of thousands of uh, PhDs that have been written uh, on silicon and its various properties. Uh, the rest of the tooling and the software and all the other chemicals involved have been uh, designed to work in this silicon, silicon dominated ecosystem. And so it'll be very, very difficult, I think, to move away from that, even if other materials do theoretically exist.
I'm going to end with a couple of questions on uh, the geopolitical aspect of it again. Um, and, and last week, again, we saw um, more measures by the US to prevent uh, uh, high tech uh, AI enabled chips, um, you know, the, the, the special purpose chips with, for AI that we were talking about to, to <coughs> ensure that that technology uh, wasn't easily passed on to China. Do you think these kind of measures will work? Well, I think they'll certainly uh, work in terms of diverting chip supply away from China towards other markets. Um, the, the question, though, is uh, how does it impact China's AI industry? Because as you say, the controls are explicitly targeted at AI chips. And I think we should expect try China to try to find workarounds. For example, if you don't have the most cutting edge AI chips, can you use larger numbers of less cutting edge AI chips to achieve the same result? You certainly can in theory. Uh, and so I think that's where China is going to spend much of its focus is trying to find alternative ways to make up for the fact that it won't have the most cutting edge chips. And there's not a lot of doubt that it's going to be a long time, half a decade, maybe a full decade before China has a chance of catching up in terms of chip manufacturing. But if there are other workarounds China can find, then it might be OK, uh, even if it doesn't have access to the most advanced chips. Last question, do, do you think uh, moves like nearshoring will succeed if you throw enough money at them? I think we've already seen in, in the US and Japan and Europe a real response from private sector investors to the subsidies that have been offered. And in some ways that's not surprising. If government's gonna subsidize people to build more factories, more factories uh, will be built. I think the question for nearshoring is once the government subsidies are gone and they're not gonna be here forever, will we end up with economically viable companies, facilities that can keep operating in a profitable manner or not. And that's that's still very uncertain. And that's the challenge that I think all government policy efforts face is it's one thing to throw subsidies at a problem, but it's a very different and much harder challenge to do so in a way that actually leaves you with viable, profitable businesses at the end. And I think for all of the Western nearshoring efforts, that's still very much a work in progress. You've studied this uh industry very closely and you've studied it from a perspective that few others have looked at it. Um, I've always found it very interesting that uh, when, when you look at uh, the technology industry, and, and I'm using the word technology in a very, very uh, liberal sense, if you look at the technology industry at one end, um, which, which is really the core, um, are the semiconductors um, which, which really power everything. And at the other end, you, you have um, these um, the the interfaces or the products that the consumer products, and, and I'm not speaking about uh, TVs or computers, but I'm but I'm really speaking about things like the metaverse. I'm I'm speaking about uh, huge social media platforms that are being created, um, where big tech pretty much um, has a controls opinions, shapes views. Um, and, and, and we've all seen uh, clashes between big tech and governments in uh, various markets around the world. Australia is a case in point. The European Union is a case in point. Many parts of Asia, including India, uh, you've had these issues. Um, which side, and, and you know, since, since um, you've written about imbalances and balances, uh, which side do you think is more powerful? Do, do you think it's, it's, it's the big tech guys at, at uh, the consumer end of the spectrum, or do you think it's it's really the chip guys? Well, I think we it's easier to see the power of the big tech companies because that's who we interact with on a regular basis. Um, but of course, all the big tech companies are able to produce products only thanks to the semiconductors inside of them. Uh, and I think we shouldn't overstate the role of, of the big tech companies, the social media platforms, the search uh, companies. Uh, certainly it's important, but in many ways, they're relying on a very concentrated supply chain of its own uh, in the chip designers and the manufacturing in Taiwan and the machine tool and chemicals that are produced in Japan and the Netherlands. Uh, and so the countries that are further down in the supply chain and the companies that are further down in the supply chain are often just as profitable. Um, and have just as much uh, concentration of their market uh, share as do the, the big tech platforms that get much more focus in public debate. Chris, thank you for spending time with us. Um, are you writing another book? <laughs> well, not yet. I feel like I just finished the last one, uh, but at, at, at some point, I'm sure, in the future. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for having me.
In our next session, we talk about an issue that is very crucial at the moment. You may have heard a lot about One Nation, One Poll, and there are very strong views on both sides. So I spoke with former election commissioner Naveen Chavla and Milan Vaishnav, the director of Carnegie South Asia, to understand all sides of this debate. Hello and welcome to the Hindustan Times Leadership Sessions Discussions. Today, our session is going to focus on a major issue that is talked about a lot in the recent weeks. And we're joined by former election commissioner Naveen Chavla and the director of Carnegie South Asia, Milan Vaishnav. Thank you both for joining us for this discussion. Thanks for having me. I want to start off with you, Mr. Chavla. Now, there's been so much debate about this and people seem to be divided. Uh, there are people who are huge, uh, hugely in favor of it. And there are those, especially the opposition has been up in arms about the suggestion of this. I wanted to ask you, this must be an issue that the Election Commission has been dealing with for quite some time now. Yes, I think that the first intervention came in 2015, uh, when a committee was set up under an MP called Mr. Nachiapan, a parliamentary committee. And that had called the Election Commission in for evidence. And the Election Commission did say that there was a possibility that it could be done. It didn't rule it out. I think it began there. Right. And what do you make of the kind of, you know, the, the form the debate has taken in the current days? You know, it's complicated. It really is a very complex issue. I am aware that there was a special session of parliament, that an extraordinary committee has been set up under the former president, which is yet to, I think, invite uh, people to participate. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, from the, strictly from an election point of view, I mean, suppose I had to do it. Um, it would be possible because we would have to increase the hardware. You would need to increase the constituencies. They would double practically. Although that happens when a general election does coincide with four or five assemblies. But when you're doing the entire country, then the need for hardware, the need for district magistrates, for uh, returning officers, for the whole bandobas to the pyramid below that, the EVMs, the VV paths, all that is not impossible, but it's not easy. Mm. One of the big things in the election commission is not just that you have a, a district magistrate in the pyramid, but a lot of intense training that goes into it. So, of course, that would also multiply manifold. Uh, and, and I'm not talking about costs. Costs can be met. But uh, uh, the election pyramid would have to almost double, if not almost treble, to be able to do these elections simultaneously. So not impossible, but not easy. I can imagine because, you know, recently we had uh, the Election Commission announcing the dates and the arrangements for the next round of assembly elections. And it took a considerable amount of time for him to cover just the logistics of these four or five states. So imagine that for the entire country. Milan Vaishnav, if I can come to you and ask you, that one of the big reasons for it, which is cited by people who are um, who support the idea, is that it is economically viable. We seem to be spending. They argue that it's a, you know every year there's an election, and we've had that for the last three decades. If we were to have them only every five years, we would save on a lot of money. But this is disputed, uh, especially in some of the recent editorials I've read. What is the reality of this? So uh, it's a good question, Sunitra. And I think you have to break down the costs into two different buckets or categories. OK, so there are the costs borne by the government for the conduct and implementation of the elections. Right. And then there's the money that parties and candidates and their supporters are spending. Let's start with the general government expenditure, right? So the estimates which are out there are that on average, a general election costs to put on around 4,000 crores. 
and a state election in a medium to large state would be 300 crores. And you say maybe it's a little bit higher now due to inflation and increased population and so on and so forth. Um, that does not strike me, frankly, as a very large number. I mean, just to put it in perspective, the uh, MP LAD scheme, the Member of Parliament Local Area Development Scheme, under which every member of parliament gets five crores a year, is 14,000 crores over five years, right? And, 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 and we don't talk necessarily about how that's wasteful expenditure. Clearly, the bigger issue is the amount of money that parties and candidates are spending. And I think, you know, the three of us might even agree that 60,000 crores is probably an underestimate, uh, given that this is very hard to quantify. It's not obvious to me that if you move to simultaneous elections, that spending is going to go down, right? Because the amount of money that aspirant members of parliament and MLAs are going to spend in their constituencies and what are some of the world's most competitive elections is still going to remain very high. And it is going to happen perhaps in a compressed period of time. But I haven't seen any convincing evidence to suggest actually the quantum of funds would be lower. Where the quantum of funds could be lower is on the holding of elections. But but I don't re really think that's a major issue, given all of the other expenditures the government of India undertakes. Mr. Chawla, would you like to, what's your opinion as someone who's held elections? Would it be cheaper if they were done together? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, and there are disadvantages uh, to doing them together. One is that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge country and... Um, even when we do a general election by itself, we require as many as 2,000 senior officers as observers, joint secretaries and above, emptying out the central government and the state governments virtually. That apart, every single political party didn't trust the state police. They all wanted the central police. So you were emptying out the police forces. You had something like, I mean, I had wanted a thousand companies and I only got 500, but I know a thousand went to Bengal not very long ago. So yes. now when you quantify this into um, a, a general election and simultaneous elections, then everybody has got used to demanding observers and central forces and how exactly and where they can come simultaneously is something that if I were in the election commission would beat me. I mean, I wouldn't know where to get them. So, uh, so once again, going back to the point that, yes, we might consider it doable from the election point of view, but would it satisfy uh, the political arena? Because we are not only talking about established political parties. We're mainly talking about those who are in opposition, whether it's at the center or the states who demand a, a level playing field. And for the yeah. level playing field, everybody's got used to observers and the police bandobas from the center. And what about the poor individual candidate who may not have a political party behind them? So aren't they also entitled to an equal level playing field? So the election commission being seen as a fair umpire to really be fair down to, because you know, we're very noisy people. And if one VV patch doesn't work or one EVM breaks down somewhere, you know, we're all over the newspapers, even if it's just one in two. But we do know that a million are working. And we've got to make all that. It has to be glitch free. So the bigger you make it, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's very, I mean, I, I would be very nervous. Yes. You know, um, which brings me to the other point. If you are, you know, so the cost was uh, one issue. And, you know, I think that both of you have given me quite a lot of clarity on that point. The other argument that's always made for it is this is the ha this is the way things were meant to be. Because since when it started in 1951, 52, till the 60s, we had simultaneous elections. And it's only later because you know, state governments were dismissed that, you know, the entirely new cycle started off. Now, Milan Vaishnav, I wanted to ask you, is that a valid argument to go back to that system of everyone doing it together? Or is it just as some 
opposition members have pointed out, that's just happenstance. It started off together because we were a new nation starting off our democratic journey. And of course, um, after that, uh, you know, they all have their own cycles and those cycles work. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I would agree more with the latter perspective, I think. I think uh, people are right in saying that India more or less had simultaneous elections from 51, 52 to 67. Uh, the cycle was first broken in Kerala in 1959 when president's rule was imposed to take down a communist party government there. Then, of course, in 1967, as we all know, the Congress party lost a number of critical states. That was the kind of end of the first party system. And afterwards, you had very unstable opposition governments where defections, counter defections led to the dissolution of many assemblies, right? That further broke the simultaneous cycle. Then, of course, in 1971, Mrs. Gandhi called early elections, which kind of firmly delinked state and national polls. So it started out simultaneous. Uh, but there is nothing hardwired in the system to suggest it should stay that way, right? I think Gautam Bhatia, the lawyer and legal analyst, had a very nice piece re recently in which he said, we have to remember that the essence of parliamentary government, in a sense, is that at all times, governments must enjoy the confidence of the House, right? And in a parliamentary setup, unlike a presidential system, you know, rigid timetables don't necessarily conform to the principles of parliamentary governance, right? Uh, and we haven't gotten into the proposal for one nation, one election. I mean, we should say there isn't an official proposal. There have been drafts of various proposals, but I think they raise really problematic considerations from the standpoint of popular consent and legitimacy. Uh, do you want to uh, point out any particular clause? Well, so let me just refer all of our viewers to the report that was put out by the Niti Aayog uh, under uh, Bibek Derbroy and a co-author Kishore Desai. What they have proposed and which builds on the Parliamentary Standing Committee report that uh, Mr. Chavla uh, earlier referenced is not a one nation, one poll, but actually one nation, two poll. So there would be two phases of elections. So if we were just to assume this would kick off with the 24 general elections for argument's sake, you would have a phase one elections where you'd have the Lok Sabha elections and elections in 14 states, which are slightly before or slightly after the general elections, right? And those would be held say in May and June of next year. Then about two and a half years later, you would pool all of the other remaining states uh, so this would be fall of November 26, in which the other half would go, right? Um, now, this raises a whole bunch of questions about what happens if there's a dissolution of a government, a coalition falls apart. Uh, you know, you can imagine a lots of contingency scenarios. But basically what the proposal says is, well, uh, first of all, if there's a no confidence motion uh, to take down a government, that must correspond with uh, or proceed hand in hand with a, a, a confidence motion in favor of an alternate government, right? If that consensus uh, is not met, then, uh, and elections are, are quite far off, you would have to have fresh elections, but that new government then would only serve the remainder of the original government's term. So it wouldn't be for five years, say it'd be three and a half years or four years. If elections are very close, then the center or the state would either go to president's rule or governor's rule, yeah. right? And then elections would then be paused until the next phase win. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, if you just take the governor's rule, president's rule idea for a second, look at the behavior of governors right now in India. The, in fact, an increasing number of analysts are saying, get rid of the posts of the governor, right? No, few people are saying, actually, let's empower the governor with even more authority, right? Uh, uh, this idea that, um, you know, if you have a, a confidence motion that proceeds with a no confidence motion, uh, there would be no horse trading, no defections. We know from the recent Maharashtra example, among others, the 10th schedule, the anti-defection law is basically broken, right? I, I think we now have confidence in, in that assessment. So, so I think, you know, this looks very good on paper, but once you get down to the nitty gritty, it actually gets very messy very quickly. And I think this, you know, you explained it so well, it really strikes at what is the heart of the opposition to this plan. Um, 
uh, Naveen Chawla, would you say that, would you, uh, would you see the point of those people who point to this and basically say that it's against the federal nature of India? I think so. Because, uh, you know, for a start, uh, all this presages very important constitutional changes. Article 85, Article 172, Article 172, 2, 172, 4. These are all important uh, because um, uh, we don't have a, a German kind of a system of a confidence or no confidence. What happens after 13 days and a central government falls? We'd have to go in in six months for an election. The election commission has no alternative. So you have to change major um, articles of the constitution and you can't do that unilaterally. You have to do it with the widest possible consultation, which must be done with the states. After all, we are a federal polity. And so a central government can't just do it on its own. Parliament can't. And, um, and you know, much thought, Sunitra went into this in the constituent assembly debates, for example. And um, are we now going to say that um, uh, that a central government will just do it? Um, when we had the when we had those debates, if we go over them, um, uh, there were months that were spent on how the uh, elections should be conducted. It was so important. So this we have to bring about changes. Changes are not easy. Changes should never be done without political consultation right across the board. And uh, that means uh, consultation with the states. And I would go a step further and say that if major changes are to come, then, you know, uh, important um, um, important legal pundits, the Narimans and others, must also be brought in into consultation. Uh, so it's it's not easy. And before 1967, just to remind you, it was the monolith party. You know, it was just the Congress party running yeah. everything. And that is when uh, it began to break. That's, that's uh, I like the way you put that. And, you know, uh, Milan, one of the, you know, what, what Naveen Chawla is saying, that brings me to that entire question as well um, of, he talks about consultation. Now, if we look at the way, if we take it from the central government's perspective, they've made this panel headed by uh, Ramnath Kovind. They also have the law commission looking into this entire issue. Now, if they were to argue that, you know, this is all and the law commission is hearing various stakeholders, would that be considered consultation enough? How much consultation or what level of consultation is OK and acceptable for a change this expansive? It's a really good question, Sunitra. There's not a very a pat answer I can give you, but let me just point out a couple of relevant factors, right? Look at the government resolution which sets up the Ramnath Kovind panel. The preamble to the resolution says, already decides ex ante, it is in the national interest that it is desirable to have simultaneous elections in the country. The, that, the conclusion is put up before the introduction, right? Uh, secondly, the terms of reference ask the committee to investigate whether the assent of half of the state assemblies will be necessary for constitutional amendment purposes. You know, there are many categories of constitutional amendment that require different thresholds. Now, the constitution lays out in Article 368.2 what types of amendments would require state ratification. I'm not uh, well positioned to make a determination on that, somebody who's not a constitutional lawyer. I would just point out that the Law Commission in its draft 2018 report, and it was never finalized, did say that the center should get such ratification if it advances the proposal, right? Um, if you look up the makeup of the committee, um, we know that the Congress uh, leader in the Lok Sabha has decided not to take part because he thinks that uh, the, the deck is already stacked. It's not clear where the consultation with states truly comes in because they're not represented uh, in this venue, right? And so, you know, not to sound so cynical, but it sounds like this is kind of a fait accompli uh, you create a committee to give it the veneer of acceptability, but actually you've already kind of baked the cake. 
Sorry, I'm mixing a bunch of metaphors here. <laughs> no, I and no, but it kind of fits in really well. So, so Mr. Chavla, are we to are we to, if you look at it practically speaking? Uh, first of all, I want your comments on this committee. What do you make of the composition of this committee? Because there have been questions about whether and and that's what Adhir Ranjan Chaudhary, that's what Milan uh, was referring to. Adhir Ranjan Chaudhary uh, objected to this as well. That uh, that's why he wouldn't join it. Um, do you think the composition of this committee going into is that is that a fair one? Well, I don't know about that. It is unusual to have a committee under a former president, but then uh, there can be new precedents that are set. I think we need for a moment to go back to the details which Milan had uh, brought out of the Nachi Upan committee. Now, that was a parliamentary committee and that devoted a lot of time and took a lot of evidence. But if you look at the conclusions of the Nachi Upan committee, it's not very neat. Um, you know, some assemblies lose part of their terms, some assemblies gain part of their terms. You're kind of drawing a partition line halfway through. Is that going to work without consultation with the states? I don't think so. I mean, uh, people will go straight to the Supreme Court and that's where it would lie. And that is why even the Nachi Open Committees give it as a kind of suggestion. Um, but it seemed to me, to me, you know, somewhat flawed, very difficult to actually implement. Now, whatever other committee sits, um, I, for the life of me, can't think of what other formula might come in that will enable everything to come together, not to mention the enormous bandobas that the election commission would have to, to carry out. I mean, we have to take that into consideration as well. It's not easy not going to be easy. And as you know, and as Milan knows all too well, we're, we are very argumentative, we're very noisy, and every single vote counts. People have lost elections and states have, um, and, and their chief ministerships by a single vote, as you know. Yes, yes. Uh, and we have managed, for example, in the 2009 election, we managed a pretty perfect election, you know. It became quite a good uh, export article for the prime minister because wherever he went, he was con congratulated. But but try fiddling with the vote. So it's, mm, um, uh, and you know, we all this is, and there's such a big debate going on about EVMs anyhow on the side. Half the people don't seem to trust those. Although I've, whatever I had to say, like Milan, I've cast in stone. I've also taken things from him about crime being. Uh, but these are all things that uh, don't lend themselves to easy elections. Milan, do you want to add to this? Um, I just, uh, you know, um, do you think that, I know that Naveen Chavla is saying that every vote counts, but in the past few weeks and months, We've seen very tricky uh, legislation uh, being passed just by the fact that the BJP uh, has such huge numbers and a majority and the backing of, in Rajya Sabha, they have the backing of parties like the YSR party and the BJD, and they are able to negotiate really tricky legislation and even things which need that kind of two-third uh, majority. Do you think it will, if it comes to that, it will be very tricky for them to get this through? Well, I think it is a high bar, Sunitra, precisely because of the impact it's going to have on federalism and on state and regional parties, right? I mean, this really gets to the core of, 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 of their existence, right? And, and their political uh, competitiveness. Having said that, we have seen them pull rabbits out of hats time and time again. Uh, you know, uh, of course, they were able to muster the strength to pass the GST. We witness what happened with Article 370, which at one point in time was controversial. Uh, we've seen what's happened with the EWS reservations, right? Uh, we have yet to see what might happen with the Uniform Civil Code, but one can imagine them actually uh, mustering the support for that. So, um, you know, I think from the perspective of the center, 
it's obvious why they would want to push for this, right? I think there's two reasons. One is is to reinforce the power of the BJP. You have a, the, the most popular prime minister in, in recent memory, without a doubt. I think polls continue to show that. And if you align state and national elections, you could take advantage of his coattails in a significant way. Uh, and this is, secondly, a government that appreciates uniformity, right? The whole idea with GST was one nation, one tax. The whole idea of the farm law bills was we don't want to have a patchwork uh, to have some states liberalize and other states not. In fact, that was the same argument for the land acquisition bill several years earlier. And it will be the argument for UCC if we ever get to that point, right? So I certainly wouldn't put anything past this government in terms of the possibilities. I do think this one is going to be slightly harder because it's going to affect all states, right? Uh, it's not going to be very easy for one party to say, well, that's only an issue that affects JNK. It really doesn't affect me because it will affect them. Right. And uh, final question really is uh, the one one argument that is often given, and I just wanted to cover and see what, what you both thought of that, is that they say that, you know, it's disruptive. Elections are disruptive uh, and having them all together would just mean that everyone's life and the citizens, the argument put forward is that the citizen would have better governance if we were to have simultaneous elections. Is that true? Naveen Chavla, do you think? No, we don't think it's true at all. Because we made it, uh, from the election point of view, we made it clear to the cabinet secretary for every single election that it's not supposed to impede development work by the announcement of a day. What is supposed to come in the way is of contractors and others raising illicit funds for elections. But if a ministry, so we set up a committee that if any ministry has any doubt, they can ask the cabinet secretary um, so that the normal work of government must go on. But it is often used as an excuse uh, by babus like myself in various ex uh in various places not to put the pen down and say, all right, I can't do any work for two and a half months or so. But that's certainly not the intention of the election commission. So it's it's a kind of trumped up excuse. But of course, if a contractor is now going to generate thousands of crores for road building, but that, that of course, the election commission would want to stop. Milan Vashem, do you think this argument is, is, uh, is something that rings true for the BJP? Because, you know, one of the things that they're very proud about is that they put all their might behind even the smallest of elections. So when we saw the civic elections in uh, Telangana, you had the top BJP bosses uh, come down and campaign for that as well. Yeah, so I, I think, uh, Sunethar, this, in fact, I think gets to the heart of the argument. I would say for the proponents of this reform, uh, this is even bigger than the cost issue, right? What is the argument? The argument is that uh, this constant election hamster wheel that India is on has a negative impact on development programs and governance due to the imposition of the model code of conduct, right? So uh, the Niti Aayog report suggests that on average, the model code is operational for about four months a year, which slows down governance. Uh, constant electoral compulsions lead to short-term thinking in, in politics, which could be bad. And the frequency of elections reduces risk taking, right? Now, it may be true that the model code of conduct is in operation for four months a year, but in select parts of the country, uh, aside from a general election, this isn't shouldn't be a nationwide problem, right? There is no need for national governance to stop. It is the BJP which has made a parliamentary system de facto presidential, right? Uh, there's, there's, there's nothing written in stone that national leaders have to campaign uh, for state elections. Perhaps state units should be in charge of state elections, right? So, so I'm not sure how compelling that line of argument is. Uh, on the question of short-termism and electoral compulsion, um, if you think about the draft proposal, uh, assume you have a, a, a new government that comes to power via a fresh election if a previous government fails. It would only serve out the rest of that original government's term. That kind of undermines the argument because then you'd have an even shorter period in which you're in power and would lead to even, even more elections, right? 
On the final point about risk taking and whether or not elections reduce risk taking, you know, I mean, not to be too flippant about it, but think about the evidence of the last decade. Big risks have been taken, right? Demonetization, farm law bills, GST, 370, EWS reservation. Elections didn't come in the way of, of any of those things, right? So, so um, intellectually, again, I understand the argument, but I, I think when you break it down, it doesn't, it, it for me is not as, as, as compelling as it might be at first glance. Well, I want to thank you both because uh, you really, um, you know, clarified on all those points and uh, it's been enlightening to hear you both. Naveen Chavla, Milan Vashnav, thank you so much for joining us on this Hindustan Times leadership discussion. Well, that's it for today. We'll be back again tomorrow. So join us then. becomes a milestone when it helps make our lives richer with love and laughter. When it helps make a cleaner, smarter and a more beautiful planet. So that you can set off on joyous new journeys and adventures. Building stronger bonds and bridging impossible distances which take you from the ever new to the forever beautiful. Opening up vistas and windows to a vibrant new world. A vision becomes a milestone when it touches millions of lives. Aditya Birla Group. Big in your life.
positive change and adaptation. Evolve is the soul of the universe and is deeply connected to us and the actions around us. There will be one thing that will last forever. Evolution. Be a part of the business evolution of India. WTC World Trade Center, Delhi at Noruji Nagar and be a part of the global culture. We keep our accomplishments fresh and we keep innovating this space. We are driven by the government of India's vision to drive growth for India. We had a dream to bring the best of the world to India. And we had the vision to create a majestic, holistic and exclusive reality. Be a part of one of India's largest commercial space revolutions. WTC World Trade Center, Delhi at Noruji Nagar. The World Trade Center offers exceptional connectivity to all parts of the city. It is closely connected to places like Lajans, Delhi and its proximity to the airport makes it even more appealing. A luxurious, upscale and 12 towers offering the most technologically advanced office space and modern features in the city. Meticulously planned and crafted 12 towers. A landmark project with a massive land span of over 34 lakh square feet area. Infused with all the modern amenities with intelligent designs, green spaces and high-end facilities. Built with a vision, planned for a greener today and tomorrow. Dedicated spaces for cultural activities, FNB courts, boardrooms, health centers, multi-layered securities and modern parking facilities to name a few. With 24-hour security, state-of-the-art facilities and an impressive list of features for your business, there would be parking space for 8,000 cars. Our commercial office spaces will meet your needs to grow and expand. The spacious floor plans offers a unique, individualized workspace and ample natural light throughout the workday. All our locations in WTC will include state-of-the-art healthcare services, fitness centers, so you can get the most out of your workspace. A reality shaping, rising, shining and standing tall. The dream place for businesses and hospitality. A reflection of supremacy. A hub for businesses to flourish and thrive. Live the dream. Lead the way. Showcase, collaborate and succeed. Be a part of the business evolution. Be a part of global trade revolutions. Many big corporates have already marked their presence at WTC Delhi. Bookings are open. Book your space now. It is a fact of life that every coin has two sides. In our case, people are just familiar with one and that is of being a money lender to the railway sector. So here is an eye-opener. At Indian Railway Finance Corporation, we nurture millions of dreams. The dreams that are powered with new ideas, will and ambition to be on top of the world. We are committed to creating a conducive environment for the railway sector to grow unhindered. Right from planning to backing up its construction to modernization, funding of high capacity wagons, coaches and high speed locomotives.
औषधि केंद्रों पर मिलने वाली दवाओं की कीमत बाजार में जो दवाएं मिलती हैं उसी क्वालिटी की लेकिन जन औषधि केंद्र में 50 प्रतिशत से 90 प्रतिशत तक उसकी कीमत कम होती है भारतीय जन औषधि परियोजना के अंतर्गत अब तक देश भर में हजारों जन औषधि केंद्र खोले जा चुके हैं जहां पर 1800 से अधिक दवाइयां और दो सर्जिकल उपकरण बहुत ही कम कीमतों पर उपलब्ध हैं। अधिक जानकारी के लिए जन औषधि सुगम मोबाइल ऐप को डाउनलोड करें या टोल फ्री नंबर एक आठ शून्य शून्य एक आठ शून्य आठ शून्य आठ शून्य आरोप कॉल करें जोड़ना है तुझे ऊंचा परों को खोल के रख कसौटी वक्त की है हौसलों को तोल के रख ऊंची है दीवारें लंबी है डगर ना है हम राही ना है हम सफर खरगोल हमारे आर एंड आर प्लान में लोग हर साल जो आसपास की ग्रामीण महिलाएं हैं उनको टेलरिंग का क्लास कराते जो स्कूल बैग्स भी हम लोग हर साल बांटते थे साढ़े आठ सौ नौ सौ के लगभग स्कूल बैग्स भी बांटते थे वो बैग्स भी हमने इनसे स्टिच कराए सक्षम बनना चाहते थे हम हमारे पेड़ों पे खड़ा होना चाहते थे कि हमने एक बार मीटिंग की मीटिंग में बोला कि सर हम इतना कार्य सीखे हैं तो और हमको दुकान खुलवा के तो दुकान खुलवा के दिया हमको यहाँ दुकान मिलने के बाद हमने सोचा की हम यहाँ जो भी कार्य करते हैं जो भी चीजें बनाते हैं उन चीजों का हमारे दुकान का नाम किया अभी आगाज है तेरा बहुत कुछ सीखना है कमर कसनी अभी बाकी है मुट्ठी बीचना है अभी आगाज है तेरा बहुत कुछ सीखना है हमने फिर इनको अपना एक जो हमारा गर्ल एम्पावरमेंट मिशन का एक प्रोग्राम होता है उसमें कि उसके जो बालिकाएं थीं उनका ड्रेस भी हमने इन्हीं से स्टिच कराया और वो प्रोग्राम में वो ड्रेसेस बहुत सक्सेसफुल थी लोगों ने उनको बहुत अप्रिशिएट किया नेक्स्ट लेवल पे हम ये प्लान कर रहे हैं कि इनको हम जो इंडस्ट्रियल स्टिचिंग मशीनें होती हैं वो हम इनको ला देंगे इन्हीं जो हमने इन बच्चों को जो ट्रेन किया है दे विल बिकम हमारा ये एक तरीके से एम्बेसडर का काम करें और हमारा आई का जो विजन है कि हम पावर जनरेशन के साथ साथ हम आसपास के लोगों का भी केयर करते हैं इसमें भी हम सफल हो पाएंगे इतिहास लिखने के लिए कलम की नहीं हौसलों की जरूरत होती है